Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering you. Some of you are asking yourself, was, was he talking about me, you know, with the Gloria thing? I don't think he was talking about me, of course, right? None of us ever think that. Happy Sunday before Christmas. It's awesome, isn't it? I mean, really, this is a special time of year. Would you agree? Help me. Yeah. I mean, in spite, in spite of all the stress, all the stuff that goes on at this time of year, I know it's hectic, got a million things going on. How many of you are done shopping for Christmas? Wow. A few more than our last service. But many of you have stuff you know you still have to get done before Christmas, which is literally Thursday. Uh, just as a quick plug, we're actually doing two Christmas Eve services at 3 and 5 o'clock here at the church. Love to have you be a part of that. It's a family service. We bring the kiddos in with us. We have a special program just for the kids, so just a cool night for doing that. But I've got to tell you that something really special happened to me this morning. My wife told me that she loves me. Now, I'm not trying to make it sound like she never does that, okay, to be clear. She, she tells me that probably every day, multiple times in the day, because I need to hear that. But for me, I have to ask myself, do I hear it afresh each time? Is it just as valuable for me to hear that this morning as it was the very first time? Some of us can remember the first time that that person in our life told us that they loved us. And, and we're like, yeah, right on. But do we have that same kind of emotion attached to it each and every time? I think sadly, not. Sadly, we don't experience it afresh and anew as much as we should. But one of the questions that I think we ought to ask ourselves is, what does it mean when somebody tells you that they love you? You know, I had a good friend of mine tell me recently that he loved me. Hopefully it didn't mean the same thing my wife meant when, you know, she told me that she loved me, okay? We recognize at some level that there's different kinds of love, different kinds of experiences we have. In fact, we use love pretty loosely in our culture, don't we? I mean, we'll say we love our favorite sports team, we love chocolate, or whatever your favorite food might happen to be. But I think we would all agree we don't love those things in the same way we love those special people that are in our lives. It's something very different. And yet, sometimes I think we don't make that as clear as we should. Ultimately, to me, love works best in the context of relationship. Certainly we can say it about those things, but I think we say it best when we're talking about that expression of relationship that we have between each other. Because at some level, my wife telling me that she loves me is an expression of her commitment and of her devotion. Her telling me that she loves me is an expression that we're in a relationship together and that she's even willing to make sacrifices because of how valuable and important that relationship is. Think about it this way, the more valuable and important a relationship is to us, the more likely we're going to be committed to it, the more likely we're going to be sacrificial even in our commitment to those things. I heard a quote recently and somebody was saying that uh, they felt that true love or real love was when you love somebody even when you don't feel like it. It's that enduring sacrificial commitment that even during the toughest of times, that you're going to stay true to that person. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of wife that I want to have. Or if you're a woman, that's the kind of husband I'm willing to bet you would like to have. That no matter what happens, whether, we success, whether we're successful or failing in that relationship with them, that they're still going to seek to love us in spite of our success or in spite of our failings. We do have, some of us, difficult love relationships. I had this growing up. I found myself in love with a lot of different girls. The problem was they didn't feel the same way towards me, okay? And love like that's hard, isn't it? It's hard when you really care and you really love another person, but they don't return that love. Most of those kinds of romantic relationships, they kind of fade and go away. I mean, if that person's not going to love me, why am I going to continue to love them, right? But we do have other relationships in our life, parent, child, where in spite of that child, possibly, not wanting to reciprocate the love, we don't stop loving them, do we? To me, that's a little bit of the way our father's love is. 
Our Father's love is such that whether we return His love or not, it doesn't take away from the fact that He loves us. The passage that was read during the Advent candle lighting this morning was out of John, a very famous verse, John 3, verse 16. And it starts off by saying that God so what? He so loved the world. Unfortunately, in our world with the easy believism that's out here, I think we've got a twisted view of what that means sometimes. Because the reality is that we have to ultimately have some kind of connection to God. We have to have an understanding of what it is that God has done as a response to his love for the world. The Apostle John, in one of his epistles, our first John, chapter 4, in verse 9, says that God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, John says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. The sad thing that's true in our world today is for so many people, it's a one-sided relationship like I was talking about. God the Father is continuing to pour out his love, continuing trying to woo people to himself, but so many of the people in our world today want to have nothing to do with that. It's truly one-sided. And in my mind, knowing even some of the pain that I experienced as a young person in that kind of a love relationship, you have to know that that hurts our Father's heart because he so desires for them to have the experience that he has for the rest of us. But he's going to continue to love them whether they love him back or not. One of the reasons that I like the passage we're going to look at today, Romans 8, is that it's filled with some of the benefits that come from the Father's love and what it means to know God's love. And if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to turn to Romans 8. And we're going to start in uh, verse 31. Paul, the author here, says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. If God is for us, who could be against us? One question I would have you consider as we move into this is who's us? Who's the us that Paul's talking about, that God is for? When I was in high school, we actually would kneel down, believe it or not, in the locker room before a game, and we would pray. We would pray that we would have God's favor. And for us, favor meant what? It meant a score. It meant a win. It meant that we were the victors in that game. I don't know what's more ironic to me that one, in a public high school back in those days, you could actually pray and it would be okay. okay. That's kind of ironic in our culture today. But what's even more ironic is across the wall from us was another team that was doing the exact same thing. They were praying that God would favor them, that he would give them victory. And we all wondered whose side would God be on. Now, mistakenly, I'm sure sometimes when we came away with the victory, (laughs) God was on our side, right? But does the victory necessarily mean that God was on our side? Now, we might think so, but is that actually so? 
In Paul's passage here, three times in Romans 8 and many times throughout the rest of his writings, he uses two very key words that I would draw your attention to. The words are in Christ. The New Living translates that phrase in Christ to belong to Christ. In other words, us is those who are in Christ. This promise, this idea that if God is for us, who can be against us is for those who belong to God. Be clear. That promise can't be taken by everybody else. I hear a lot of times people quote Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. But they seem to limit themselves to the next part of the passage, which says what? To those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You can't claim these promises if you're not in Christ. If you're not one of us. A sobering example for me is out of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. I just want to segue there because I want to deal with something that I think is amiss within culture today. But Jesus here in our verse 22 of chapter 7 says, On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now what's sobering to me about this is these aren't atheists. These aren't agnostics. These are people who are calling Jesus Lord. They're people that are casting out demons in His name. They're doing miracles in His name. They're prophesying in Jesus' name. And yet when they stand before Jesus on Judgment Day, he says, I don't know you. That's sobering to me. And it should be sobering to us. It's an illustration that sometimes people think they're in Christ when in fact they're not. They think they're one of us when in fact they're not. I hear a lot of people today that say, hey, I believe in Jesus. Well, good for you. Even as James says, even the demons believe that. So what separates us from the demons in that respect? I want to make sure that we as a church are crystal clear about this. Here's why. I don't want us to miss any of the other benefits that comes from being in the Father's love. I want to make sure that you know that you're one of us, that you have relationship with Him. At the very least, it's an understanding that Jesus died on a cross for your sin, but notice why he rejects those who come to him on Judgment Day. Did you catch that? He rejects them because of what? It says, away from me those who break God's laws. Jesus even instructed his own disciples. He said, if you love me, do what? Obey my commandments. It's weird every once in a while because I'll get the impression from people that they think that God abolished the law in Christ. Jesus didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled the law. The law still stands there as a guide to us as how we're supposed to interact and have relationship with our Father. We're under grace now because we have fallen so short of it, but it's not now that we kick to the curb what God has called us to do in living our life. Because here's a reality. Our true belief is evidenced in our behavior. And Paul's writing to people here in Romans 8, about people that he sees, people he knows who are in Christ. And I think that's what we want to be drawn to. We want to ask ourselves, Lord, am I truly in your name? Because I don't want any of us, myself included, I don't want to end up before God on Judgment Day and have him say, hey, don't even know you. Away from me. You've broken my Father's laws. But the beauty of this for you and for me is if we belong to God, if we're in Christ. One of the things that Paul tells us, I think, in this passage today is, I'm invincible. You know, when I was in high school, I thought I was invincible. I don't think so much anymore, okay? But the reality here is that I have to remember that if God be for me, then who can be against me? That in that respect, I'm invincible. He's, Paul's not trying to say that nobody's going to come against me, that nothing's going to not attack me. He's trying to say that even in that, though, I will be successful, that they will not prevail. Isaiah 54, verse 17, the prophet writes, In the coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. 
Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Some of you might know the name David Livingston. Livingston was a 19th century missionary to Africa. And oftentimes when he would come back to Great Britain where he was from, people would say, don't you get scared? Aren't you afraid? I mean, you could die down there. Livingston always had a response for them. And it was a beautiful response in my mind. He would tell them, he said, I'm immortal until God calls me home. In his mind, he was invincible. As long as he was doing the things of God, he was invincible. Now, with that said, I don't want to go jump out in front of a train or something. I'm invincible, right? Okay. I mean, I need to be smart about my invincibility. But with that said, I need to go forth in this promise that if I believe in God, that I belong to God, that I'm invincible. That as the world would come to attack me, as other things would seek to attack me, that I will still prevail and they will not. And some of us need to hear that, especially this time of year. Because the things of life come at all of us. They attack all of us. And it's a good reminder that I will prevail in Christ. Verse 35 in this passage is translated by the new living in a way that I think is beautiful. It says, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And he's dealing with what I think is the other side of the coin. Not unlike the team when I was a kid that thought if we won, God was with us. Sometimes we think that if bad things seem to be happening, God's not with us. But if we belong to him, even in the midst of those things, God is still with us. And that's part of what Paul's trying to say. He's trying to say, despite all these things that may be happening to you, God is still there. God still cares. You're invincible. That's why he begs that question. Because the answer, of course, is no. Of course, God still loves us. No matter what we go through, the trials, the tribulations, the persecution, frankly, that's all part of living in a fallen world among a lot of other fallen people. Paul told young Timothy in his second letter, he said, yes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But even in the midst of it, God will be right there with me. Livingston himself, for those of you that know or don't know, Livingston died ultimately in Africa. He died of dysentery and malaria. But he lived to his last day knowing that God was with him. And even in his death, God, I believe, was glorified. Paul quotes something here in the passage that's out of Psalm 44. And it's this statement, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And somebody earlier mentioned that that kind of seemed confusing to them. It was like it was stuck in with everything else that Paul was saying. But don't miss what Paul was truly saying. He's trying to draw a con contrast. He's trying to say by looking at this psalm, that at times when it looks like we're sheep going to the slaughter, it's still there for what? His sake. It's still there for God's glory and God's purposes. What a dramatic contrast he draws. Because the next thing he says is that we are more than conquerors. Those five words in that phrase, we are more than conquerors, is actually only one word in the original language. And the word means to be completely and overwhelmingly victorious. The closest English word that we have is that we vanquish our enemies. That we're completely and overwhelmingly victorious. So don't miss what he's saying. On one hand, these horrible things seem to be happening and we seem to be like lambs or sheep being led to a slaughter. But even in the midst of that, we're victorious. Not just victorious, but overwhelmingly victorious. It's the only time that word is used in the entirety of the Bible. In other words, we're not defeated in those circumstances. We don't just have to endure or survive them. Ours at the end, no matter what the end might be, ours will be a decisive, overwhelming victory. Amen, right? God, in the midst of our trials and struggles, is still, if we are part of His, 
If we are in Christ, then the victory is going to be overwhelming. This week it reminded me of what Paul said to the Philippian churches. Our verse 13 out of chapter 4, Paul said, I can do everything, not some things, not most things, but I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's the very first verse that I ever memorized because it's such a great reminder to me that if I'm in Christ and because of Christ, I can do anything. I can endure anything because he's right there with me. Paul, in our Romans 8 passage, bases all of this on God's sacrificial commitment in his love. And he reminds his readers, as it should remind us, that God did not spare his son. When God saw his son being arrested, God could have changed his mind and stepped in. So, no, I'm not going to let that happen. When Jesus was hauled to the torturers and beaten over and over again, God could have stepped in and spared his son, but he didn't. When he was drugged through the streets with this heavy crossbeam on his back, God could have stepped in, but he didn't. When he was being nailed to that cross, God could have stepped in, but he didn't. When his son cries out to him, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? God could have stepped in, but he didn't. God did not spare his son because of his love for you and I. Do you think that's a big deal to him? It's a super big deal to him. Is it a big deal to you? Is it a big deal to me? Because it should be. It should change our life. God gave us the best that He had to offer. The life of His only child. Something that most of us would never be willing to do for somebody else that we know. But He did it for you. And if He did that, is He not going to give us all things? Is Paul's argument. If he gave the greatest gift, how's he not going to give something that pales in comparison to that? If you are in Christ, if you belong to him, you are invincible. I'm also innocent. Got to tell you, I didn't hear that very often growing up. (laughs) But because I belong to God, he declares me innocent. That's what the word justification means. It means to declare somebody innocent. When I was a young person, I did something really stupid and got a pretty serious citation for it. Knew somebody who hooked me up with a judge and he fixed the ticket, as they call it, okay? And arranged for it not to be on my record. He only just gave me a warning. He said, hey, if I see you back in here, he says, you're going to pay double for this. And it was a pretty serious crime, but it was a beautiful thing for me to have that erased from my record. If he could just have erased all the other bad stuff that was on there, right? But see, that's the beautiful thing about what Jesus does. Jesus erases all the record. See, the thing about justification is it it isn't progressive. It isn't proportional. You're not partly justified. You're either wholly justified or not. When God declares you not guilty, the record is cleared. Now, with this, be mindful. God's not turning a blind eye like my judge did to my sin. The judge that I went before, he didn't pay the penalty for my crime. Jesus did. And the reason my entire record has been cleared is because Jesus paid the price for the whole thing, as he did for you. He took the ledger book of my sin, and it's stamped now that says paid in full. And if you're in Christ, that's what it says on your ledger book as well. Paul points out that not only that, he was raised from the dead. He didn't stay in the grave. That he is now sitting at the side of God the Father and he's making intercession for us. To me, that's what I call knowing somebody in a high place. A lot better than my judge. If you're in Christ, then you're innocent. 
Let's finish out our passage here, verse 38. Paul says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Not only am I innocent, not only am I invincible, but what this is telling me is that if I'm in Christ, I'm inseparable because I belong to Him. My wife and I were in a tour in Israel a number of years ago, and uh, we were there with a group that was from California that didn't know, the Albuquerque group. And there were people from California that came up to my wife and I at one point and said, okay, we're kind of taking bets on how long you guys have been married, because you're obviously newlyweds. And we're like, "Uh, actually, no, we've been married at least 15 years, I think, at the time, right? You know why they thought that, though? Because we were inseparable. Practically, in the way we conducted ourselves in that relationship, they could say, wow, you guys are like lovebirds, right? Because you carry yourself in such a way that you're inseparable. That was a beautiful thing to be said about our relationship, but can that be said about our relationship with God? Is that what other people see in our relationship with God? Can they tell that we love Him in response to the great love that He's poured out to us? Paul says here, he says, I am sure, I'm confident you could say, that in life and in death, we're inseparable. Think about it, in life, He's our Emmanuel. He's God with us. In the midst of all that stuff going on in life, God Himself is right there with us. When we die, we go to be with him. (laughs) It's win-win, right? It's even better when we die. Even in the death of those that are precious to us, God is there. We've all suffered the loss of people that were precious to us in this life. But knowing that God was there, I think, makes a world of difference. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. You know, the irony to me is I've seen much of this in ministry over the years is that oftentimes it's these times in life that people pull away from God. And the irony is many people will tell you that paid attention, that's when sometimes He's the closest. I would say that's when He's almost always the closest. Because as it says here, He knows that we're brokenhearted. And he's going to rescue us during that time. Paul mentions the angels and the rulers. Well, the angels would never come between us and God. The angels know how precious we are to God. The rulers would be another way of describing demons, those who have left God's realm and are seeking to rule with Satan. But they can only mess with us up to a certain point. They can't separate us from God. The powers that's talked about here, I think, is a reference to earthly rules, earthly rulers. Earthly rulers can't do anything to affect or impact the relationship that we have with God. Paul also talks about the present and the future. The stuff that we're going through now, that can't separate us from God. The stuff that's coming down the road that we don't even know about yet, that stuff can't separate us from God either, unless we let it. If we stay tight to God, if we stay in that place of being inseparable, then we can know that God there is right there alongside of us. He also talks about the height and the depth. The height refers to the world above. Another way of describing this would be Paul's looking to the inhabitants of heaven. The depth is the world below, the inhabitants of Hades or hell. And with all of this, he's saying that nothing... Every realm that there is, there's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The question I want each of us to look to today is, what does our relationship with God look like? Do people see me in Christ? Do people see me as someone who belongs to the family of God? 
Because if they don't see me that way, how's God viewing me? Does my life evidence that I see this as the most precious relationship that I have? As special as it was for my wife to tell me that she loved me this morning, how much more precious that every day I wake up, God is saying the very same thing to me. I love you. He sees me as an adopted son of one of his precious ones. How am I now responding back in that relationship? Am I recognizing the fullness of benefits that comes from that relationship that God has with us? I've got to tell you, there's very little, if anything, that I would allow to come between my wife and I. That's because the relationship is so precious to me. Sadly, I think a lot of times we let stuff in this life, our own pursuits, our own idols and false gods, all those kinds of things to steal the worship and the love that is most deserving to our Father. The one who is willing to stamp our ledger and say, paid in full, you're innocent. But know this, Christian, if you're in Christ, if you belong to Him, you are invincible. You are innocent. And if you are in Christ, you are inseparable from God. God is going to keep you and hold you, and He's going to take you through whatever the world is going to throw out at you, and all's going to be good. And even when it seems like you're that sheep being led to a slaughter, you can have the confidence of knowing somehow God's going to use this for His glory, for His purposes. Doesn't mean we're going to understand how. It just means we know that it will because of the kind of relationship we have with our Father. I'm hopeful that that's the kind of relationship you're going to celebrate this week for Christmas because that's what it was all about. The whole story of Christmas was Jesus coming to this earth as a baby, growing up to be a man, dying on a cross so that you and I could be reconciled to God. Don't be one of those who isn't returning his love. Be one of those who's trying to do as much as you can to say, I love you too. Which is what I told my wife this morning. I love you too. Would you stand? Father, what a, what a reminder this has been this week that, you know, very oftentimes, Father, I get my eyes off of the prize, Lord. I I allow the things of this life, the things of this world to impact me. And, and Lord, sadly, sometimes I forget that in you I'm invincible. I forget, Father, that in you I'm innocent, that you've wiped my record clean, that I am now inseparable from you, that you are my Emmanuel, that that precious word for your son is a person who's an active part of my daily life today. Father, even as I say that, I know it's a good reminder for me and some of my brothers and sisters, but I recognize there may be some, Lord, who are not in Christ hearing this, who don't know for sure that they belong to you. And Father, I would pray that today would be a day of repentance for them, that whatever it is that's attractive about this life or their flesh or whatever, that they would turn from those things and they would turn to you. They would recognize that none of those false gods of this world have died on a cross for them. None of those false gods have paid their debt, but only you've done that. And Jesus, I thank you for that. It's my hope that others would come to terms with loving you for what you've done for us, and they would know the truth that God does truly love the whole world, so that all who believe in him would not perish, but would receive eternal life. And all of God's people in agreement simply echoed, Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.